Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining uh, our latest uh, PwC LinkedIn Live, The Power of People Reimagined. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by two colleagues at different ends of the world. We've got Christine Randazzo, who is our co-lead for our reward and wellness practice based in New York. Good morning, Christine. Thank you for getting up early. And at the other end of the, the world, we've got Andrew Curcio. Um, late there, Andrew, um, our co-lead as well, alongside Christine. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We're going to have a, a, a chat, a discussion around total wellness and, and reward. Um, but just before we do that, um, people joining are welcome. Please feel free to ask any questions throughout. I'll be monitoring the chat and the questions, and I'll try and put those into the discussion. And if we miss any, um, then I will make sure we come back to you offline afterwards. So just before I turn over to Andrew and Christine, um, perhaps it's worth me just setting the scene in terms of um, some of the facts and figures and findings from our latest PwC CEO survey. It's the 26th year we've run it. We launched it a couple of couple of months ago. Um, and some really interesting findings there. Um, in, in, in the world in which we live at the moment with you know, the high, high inflationary uh, pressures, the cost of living crises, um, interesting what CEOs are saying that is that they are focused very much on cost containment, but not at the expense of talent and skilled labour. Um, and actually only 19% of the CEOs said they are looking at some form of headcount reduction. Um, 52, you know, just over 52% of the respondents said that um, the, the, you know, the, the, the imperative of um, uh, um, the skill shortage, i.e. the lack of skills, they feel will impact their profitability and growth um, over the next five to 10 years. And so there's a real focus um, around uh, upskilling, around finding and acquiring talent. And so you know, nearly three quarters of the respondents said they are actively looking at investing in um, upskilling, retooling the workforce um, as the nature of jobs is changing um, quite quite drastically. So just to make a bit of sense of that, um, you know, I think um, Andrew or Christine, either of you, if you know, in terms of the, the, they're saying around cost containment, but not cutting back on workforce, how do you make sense of that in the context of the work you're doing? Yeah. So Peter, I'll start off here. You know, one, I think those statistics are very consistent with what we've been seeing with organizations in the market. I can speak to here in the US where there have been certain industries where there have been some high profile layoffs. Um, but you, you know, some of those at least have been driven by kind of course correcting maybe an over hiring that has happened over the last couple of, of years. Um, that said, I think every organization that we work with and talk to are still, I think, focused on making sure that they are spending their money wisely and efficiently and delivering value to their employees where they invest. But every organization that we talk to are still concerned about attracting and retaining talent and making sure that they have the right rewards offer and employee experience in place to be able to do that. Yeah, I think, Christine, just to build on that, it's interesting, isn't it, that CEOs are saying that uh, there is cost containment, but there's still workforce pressures, uh, both from the perspective and attracting and retaining the right skills and skills for the future, uh, which come at a premium. And so whether it's in certain countries, certain levels, uh, certain industries, we are still seeing uh, pay premiums of 20 to 40 percent on trying to attract the right talent. And, and that competitiveness of pay uh, in a particularly high inflation environment. Uh, is a real challenge for employers uh, because the expectations of, of people uh, are, are, that, uh, are to increase the salary. I mean, cash is so much more important and valued at the moment than it has been in, in recent years. Uh, and so I think notwithstanding the cost containment pressures, uh, companies are still paying for top talent. The question is where they're getting the money from uh, and what else do they stop spending on? And I, and I think that is a real concern for organisations. Yeah, I think I think I mean you kind of highlight there. We, we are in an environment where yeah, we, we've got you know, high inflationary pressures, cost of living, organisations needing to contain costs. So how, how do you square that though? How can organisations you know optimise costs and at the same time give empl employees what they want, particularly from a from a reward perspective? Yeah, I think it's. 
you know, Christine and I spend many nights, days talk, talking about this. It's, it's, uh, we we obviously find it fascinating. But I think the key point here is that, uh, or the key question is that, what do people value rather than what they want? I, I can give it, get a whole list of things of what I actually want, but out of those things, what do I truly value, and what value do I place on it? Uh, and I think unlocking that equation is critically important to be able to either not spend any more money. Or, or actually spend less. Uh, and I recently uh, had a client where um, it was investing in people. So it, it was actually uh, increasing the amount of money that it wanted to spend on, on its, its people. So the question became, where best do I spend that money? What's the best return that I'm going to get? And so I think unlocking that is critically important. But I know Christine and I, you know, we, we chat about this sort of weekly uh, yeah. on, on, on that particular problem. Yeah, I also think over the the last several years, um, and understandably so, a lot of organizations have added to and expanded, you know, their benefits, their policies, their programs that are available to employees. Um, and I think what's what's ended up, at least in some cases, is um, you know, so many things that employers are offering. That, you know, in, in some cases, those things may not be valued anymore, right? Or, you know, or um, there's kind of a need to um, kind of whiteboard things and say, okay, if we were building this up for scratch, like what is the prioritization of what we would offer to employees and where are we going to get the, the biggest return on the dollar? Um, um, and, and also really digging into how do we get match employees with the benefits and programs at the right time to make sure that they're utilizing them in the right way? Because what we also find with a lot of organizations, you, you know, many um, that we work with do, you know, have a great spectrum of, of, of offerings, but there's almost so many that they're not valued because you couldn't possibly educate all your employees on all the different options to them. So there's also, I think, been you know, a shift to make sure you have the, the right build up and also making sure that you have the right technology and employee experience to get people to the right place at the right time to be able to use those those programs. And, and Christine, that, that, that really goes to that question, you know, can we do it or, you know, we should be asking, should we do it? And, and, and I think traditionally, when we look at total reward, total comp frameworks, we, we tend to ask, the first question we tend to ask, what do others do? Let's match what others are doing. Uh, how much is it costing? What's the usage? What's the take-up rate? There are some benefits that you don't want a high take-up rate, but you want to be doing it. For, they might be care and well-being type allowances. What's the administrative cost to, to doing that? So it's a very traditional top-down approach to whether we should be offering. And I, I think, Christine, that's where it's. I think a lot of organisations have got into the position they have because they see many organisations offer certain benefits and parts of total reward. And the competitive landscape is such that if I'm a bank now, I'm looking for tech staff, right? So I've got to offer tech type benefits in a financial services institution. So all, all of a sudden I'm adding to, to and layers and layers of this. And so I'm getting to dozens and dozens of benefits that may only be valued by a very small cohort. It might be more expensive to provide than the value it's actually driving. So I think I think implicit in what you say though, though Andrew, if I may, is kind of well, yeah, we look what the others are doing, we'll match that. So you, you, that to me doesn't sound like it's going to be very differentiating from a kind of a you know employer brand, employee brand, mm -hmm. you know, sort of proposition. So disabuse me of that kind of challenge. No, hundred hundred percent. I think I think the whole uh, and, and you, you see this in financial services, right? Ban banks are paid the way banks are paid you know, is there any you, you know you could ask you could say that the question is should pay be a differentiator maybe not pay but how does total reward differentiate you as an employer and and by doing what everyone else is doing uh, you, you essentially just um you're not differentiating at all uh, in fact it's the sameness um it's like the argument which has you know, sort of pre-covid was it was a real uh differentiator if you had hybrid working uh, now, if you don't have some form of hybrid working and support of, of remote working, then then it's a real negative, right? Yeah. So so it's it's negating the the market. 
And by thinking about this very differently from, from an employee perspective and building that out from levels of importance and understanding the, the question, which is what do our employees really value and what do they find important rather than what are others doing? That's still relevant, but not as the first question. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to pause you there because we've got a few questions coming through. So I'm going to stick one up on on the screen there from, from Jessica Garbett, which is, you know, what are you seeing to be some of the benefits that employees are valuing the most in the context of prioritization? And I, I guess that leads to, a, is it homogenous? Are you seeing it the same across all sectors or geographies or, you know, how, how do you respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I can comment here. The I think there are some trends that actually follow through on a global basis, you know, no matter what industry you're looking at, no matter what demographic you're looking at. Um, and generally what I'd say there is there's a very high value that employees pays, you know, one on cash pay. Right. Certainly, um, you know, base pay is still very important and, you know, one of the major drivers. Um, but two that fall right underneath that, that we've seen gaining importance over time. One is um, upskilling and career development, which is not something that has traditionally been thought of as a reward. Um, but that's one of the things that that we're really um, talking to organizations about is really expanding kind of the view on what sits under that bucket. Um, and that is a very important part of the value proposition for an employer. So, you know, upskilling and career development. And then, and third, the, the what we're finding is really flexibility, time off, work-life life balance um, is hugely important. It was important before the pandemic. I think it, it got a, a, a light shined on it during the pandemic. And I don't see that going away anytime soon. Jessica, great, great question. Just to add some numbers to that, because I do like my numbers, but you know we've got employee preference longitudinal study that goes over 12 years now. And what that shows is over that time, the relative importance of financial reward has dropped by 24%. In other words, if we had $100 uh, uh, you know, in 2009, I think the study starts, um, more than 80% of that is expected to be financial reward. Now it's less than 60 uh, and that doesn't mean that financial reward is unimportant because as we're saying at the moment, the last six to nine months, very important. But the, the benefits that Christine talked about, which is around hybrid working about well-being, has doubled in value. Upskilling and development has tripled in value, in relative importance and value. So I think we've got the research to demonstrate that this is actually a global number. It it it, it does vary. Uh, somewhat a, a little bit by by jurisdiction, by country, by level, but but not significant enough to call out. I think on your on your point around skilling, I mean, which I think is something I know we've talked about a lot for many many years. Um, you know, Diva, we, you know, when we launched New World New Skills, right? It was actually around the fact that you know the nature of jobs are changing and kind of moving to the whole kind of currency of, of skills. But you know, I think th throughout the pandemic, I think it really brought it into sharp focus because we saw then. Actually, I think it was you know, nearly three quarters of workers were, you know, proactively upskilling themselves, particularly around digital skills. Not surprising yeah. given the thrust around around technology coming into the workplace. Then, but I think also I'd observe now. I think given the you know, the sustainability, the climate challenge we face, and the creation of new jobs, um, I think what I'm certainly seeing is, is is many workers kind of actually almost demanding it right from 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 their employer employers. You know, not not you know, as in train train me as a citizen in the world, not just as a functionary within the organisation in which I I currently am employed. Because actually, yeah. in my preference, you know, I might not be with you for the the twenty year career, as maybe was hitherto the case. And that that generation generationally, that's changed. So we know that careers are seen to be shorter, and the views of of what I'm getting from an employer. Um, need to be more immediate. Uh, but what's interesting is it's also a change in compensation philosophy. So you've got this real tension between rewarding for mastery of skills versus rewarding for output. And so traditionally, we've got this pay for performance output. You, 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 this is your output, you perform. What we've seen over the last few years, particularly during COVID, is that people have worked really hard, have mastered their skills, but rewards have been either unaffordable or or 
you know too difficult or actually not not available and so there's i think there's a shift now and if you're not asking the question what are we rewarding for what's the purpose of our reward is it for mastering skills is it for pure output is it for thinking about career five years time and and then defining reward as broadly as possible gives you the best chance to attract and retain people it's not the silver bullet but it gives you the best chance and, and, and just uh, Melanie, thank you for your your, your comment observation you know, here around job crafting, right? And and, and for me, this, this is bringing up another, another thing we're seeing with lots of workers around the world of they don't necessarily want to be you know shoehorned, siloed into the same place. They want the ability to be much more expansive, to have that agility. Um, Christine, you're going to take 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 out Melanie's point there. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, I think. Um especially we see this on a general gener generational basis, right? That employees do want to bring their full selves to work, right? And um, really um, know that they're they're working for something, I think, larger, larger than themselves. So understanding, you know, the the, the purpose um, and how they can impact their broader community and world is 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 definitely very important and becoming increasingly so. Yeah, I think one one uh, just to build on that, Christine, uh, time is really valuable. And mm -hmm. a lot of the things that we talk about around reward is to giving people back more time. Now, you know, we we as a firm talk about this a lot with our own people, which is around automation efficiency to be able to do more uh, exciting type work, more strategic work. That is what the workforce is saying. Give me, give me work that's going to really stretch me. But what we're also saying is people are overworked. One of, one of the biggest pressures, upward pressures that we've got on compensation levels is the fact that, that we've got an element of the workforce, if not a, a large element, that have an unsustainable level of work. So I might be working for an organisation because it's purpose-led. I, I know I can get more pay elsewhere, but I'm going to stay. However, I'm not working 40, 45 hours. I'm working 60 hours a week and I'm getting paid less than what I otherwise pay. So I think job design is actually contributing to the upward pressure in pay. And with a, with a furry or, or fuzzy definition of total reward, making it more difficult to um, to talk about the, the value proposition of why someone would be working that, that amount of time. And simply by saying, let's be more efficient to give you more work, just doesn't cut it anymore. We need to be giving people time to be doing hobbies, bring them into work, learning skills that are not relevant for your job, something that, that's going to be relevant for your career and your personal development. And I think employers that are doing that, that they have a competitive advantage. Yeah. So and, and I'm just going to—I'm going to be rude and just cut you off. I'll tell you why, Christine. So I want to get one more question in, and then I'm going to come to you both three top tips because I've just looked at the clock and uh, it's racing yeah. away. Um, so this is this is from Will Barkway around. What, what value would you place on leadership and culture when it comes to wellness in the workforce? The ability to engage and retain talent should investment be allocated to upskilling for leaders and managers rather than direct to employees. Christine, do you want to say that one? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's both. Right. So so leadership is is an utmost importance here. Right. If you do want to um, show your people that investment in their well-being um, and making sure that they are practicing habits and utilizing benefits that betters their well-being is important, that that message definitely needs to come from the top um, and it needs to follow through in the managers that those those employees report to each and every day. Um, but, uh, you know, so yes, leadership and culture is so important in actually being able to um, encourage employees to take advantage of these things. Um, but underlying everything is you need to have the right programs and tools in place to support those employees in the first place to have everything work as it should. Brilliant. Right. So listen, I'll, I'll give you my sort of thoughts from what I've heard. Right. I think first and foremost is you know, total wellness isn't a replacement for total reward in the traditional sense. Right. That reward is a component of the total wellness. Secondly, I'm hearing kind of the the criticality of individual individual preferences um, and and organisations listening to their workforce essentially, right? In terms in terms of that. Um, and thirdly, what I'm also not hearing is this is going to cost employ employers more necessarily. Actually, it could cost less, but actually the the benefit could be many fold as a result of listening to, to to employees and what have you so i'm gonna come to you both actually in terms of you know can you give us your three 
um, things you want people to remember around, you know, or to do as a result of listening to you around what you're seeing in the in the market around the globe um, in the total wellness space? Andrew, should we start with you? Yeah, no, thanks, Peter. I, th- I think you've summed it up well. You actually caught probably one of my one of my uh, one of my three. I, I think start start uh, as as you do start at the beginning. Understanding employee preferences, data, and insight is just so critical to be able to leverage that, and then provide these personalised, tailored approaches to certain cohorts. Without that data without that understanding that it's a bottom up approach with the employee in the, in, in the center of that it, you go back to the the equation which is what do others do what's the, the top down approach so absolutely use the data and insight and and I think think about the employee experience cultural leadership there was a great question earlier as levers in order to to do that and to be able to um, arm your leaders and managers with with this data and insight to be able to develop the personalized strategies and conversations and the only thing that I'd add, Andrew, is to make sure that we also pull it through to business outcomes at the end. So, you know, think about um, total wellness in terms of supporting your employees to make sure that they can bring their best selves to work. Um, there is data that um, links wellness and habits to better engagement, which leads to more productivity, better business outcomes. Um, you know, and and doing the right thing by your people while balancing, I think, business goals as well. Brilliant. Um, lovely to see you both. And, and Christine, thanks for getting up early. Andrew, thanks for staying up late. Right, I think you have some, some, some really fabulous insights there. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I hope it's been helpful for you. Um, if there are any specific topics you would like us to cover, please you know, feel free to drop a line on my, on my LinkedIn um, profile and we'll endeavor to do that meanwhile i think the next linkedin live we're planning is probably in about three weeks time we're going to be focusing squarely on leadership in the context of transformation and i'll be joined by anthony abatello um, in the us and joe salter um, who runs pwc center for transformative leadership so thanks very much indeed for your time today i wish you a very pleasant rest of your day wherever you are bye-bye, bye-bye.